All right. Are we good, Kirby? Good. All right. I, I want you to uh, actually, if you can find your index, because I do want to uh, show you quite a few scripture, and I. Uh, the reason I want you to see that, and translations really don't matter to me, which one you have or which one you're looking at. But uh, if you'll find Exodus chapter 12 and put your finger in your index or something, marker in your index, then uh, it would be easier to flip back and forth to uh, these, these scriptures. What is today? Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday. Hallelujah. They're gathering all over America and literally all over the world by the millions, millions and millions all over the world gathering on this day. And what are they gathering to celebrate? Jesus rising. Jesus' resurrection. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Isn't that basically what we're all taught that it is? Yes. Right? Yeah, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And of course, that's what we're taught to look at the scriptures and see that. And, you know, we are basically the product of our culture. Isn't that true? Now, if we were all born in Japan or we were born in China or India, then would we have a different story? Yes. Yeah. So would we be wrong because we were born in these places and have a different story? Would we be wrong? Absolutely not. But according to Christianity, we would be. Because if we can embrace this season and their beliefs about this season and their ideology, then in their eyes, we're not the children of God. You, you mean that, that deal where, where Jesus was in the grave for three days and three nights, but somehow from Friday to Sunday morning was how this all happened? Yeah, it, don't, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't count. doesn't measure up. But anyway, I want to talk to you about that since that's what it is. As a matter of fact, it's going to take me a year to talk to you about what I'd like to talk to you about this morning about this because it's so much. Why? It, it's, it's all of Scripture. It's about. It's not just Scripture. It's all of any, quote, spiritual material. So anywhere you go back in ancient mythologies and ancient history, this is what you're going to find the story. But yet, I think there are very, very few. I'd say probably not one, maybe out of 100,000, and may, that might be a very, a very gracious number. Maybe, maybe not one out of a million have any idea what this is really about. And I, I mean, that's... That's broad. So, and I, even the people who don't embrace this with the Christian ideology still don't know what it's about. And so, what it is about to me is phenomenal when you see it. And I want to see if I can do that. And like I said, I, I would like to. I would like to keep it to forty-five minutes, no more than an hour. And it's hard for me to condense all that I see, all I want to say, all that I'd like to share in that short of a period of time because it's so much. And there's so much to be seen. And so, you know, if you can hear it, I pray that you can hear and that other people will be able to hear it as well. So here is where the first time in Hebrew, this is not called Easter. Even though Easter is mentioned in the King James Bible in Acts, and only, that, only one time is it mentioned in the book of Acts in the King James Bible. In other Bibles in the book of Acts, it's actually called Passover. And it comes from the Greek Pascha. But Passover is a Jewish holiday or it is celebrated as a Jewish festival. And it's called Pascha. Pascha in Greek. But in Hebrew it's Peshach. So they sound similar. But, and, and they basically mean the same thing. They mean Passover. But what is Passover and what does that mean? So here when you look at Exodus chapter 12 verse 11 is the first place you're going to find it. It says, And thus shall you eat it with your loins gird, shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. It is the Lord's Passover. And I did this, uh, I did this maybe last week or the week before. I, I just went ahead and put... The Passover is, of course, about this symbol, right? Everybody, everybody knows that the Passover is about that symbol. That symbol is called the what? The cross. The cardinal cross. The cross. That's what this Passover is about. And it is about that, but uh, Passover. It's about the cardinal cross. In Hebrew, this word 
And I just want you to hear the definition of this word in Hebrew. Pascal, actually the word means expansion. It means abundance. It means to skip or jump or hop like as though you were dancing, like you're dancing for joy. So, so it, it has all of those meanings to it. Now, mostly we're taught that it means that you take an animal, slit its throat, and take its blood and use its, barbecue its meat and have a festival, a feast. Basically, that's what we're taught that it is. And so then Jesus begins to be the substitute of the Jewish Passover. So that's why they killed his flesh. And he says in the book of John, you have to eat my flesh and you have to drink my blood if you're going to be one with me. Now that's cannibalism, and so we don't practice that, do we? So instead of practicing cannibalism, we substitute it for cracker and grape juice. Right? Unless you're in Orthodox churches, the Orthodox churches use Mogan David 2020. That old... Little old street wine. <laughs> yeah, that stuff, it'll, it'll kick you. That, more, that old Mad Dog, old Mad Dog 2020. Some of y'all probably don't, have never drank that. Actually, we used to serve that here. We served, that, we served Mad Dog 2020 when we did uh, communion. Gosh, and I'm going back 30 years. Back when we actually did do that here. We were breaking away from it, but we did it once a year here as a traditional thing. And so, but it means to, again, I'll just give you the definition. It means expansion. That's what Passover, it means abundance. And that's what's happening right now. If you begin to look at nature, you'll begin to see that's exactly what's taking place. Nature is expanding and it's showing itself in abundance. And everything in nature right now is skipping and hopping and singing, isn't it? You can go out and just listen to it. It's just, it's like that. And so you can see that. But the word originally is an astrological term and it actually means the sun, S-U-N, has passed over this particular mark right here. And it's passed over this. And why would it be that it's passed over this mark? And this mark is March the 21st. And that's always, that's, that's pretty much set in stone. And this mark right here is September the 21st. And that is, what is that called in astrology? It's called the equator, the equinox, the equator. Equa, equa, actually means equal. Why is it equal? The reason it's equal is because the days balance out. 12 hour of daylight and 12 hour of dark. 12 hour over in the fall, 12 hour, so the days balance out. So what happens when the sun reaches this mark? And you might think, well, it don't mean that much. But my prayer is that it'll go beyond your head and it'll touch your heart so you can really see what it's about. It's not about religion. It's not about jumping through hoops. It's not about believing anything. It's happening whether you believe it, know it, or accept it or what. It's happening anyway. And it, in its happening, it's wanting to take us with it and cultivate and develop us. But we have to do something which most of us aren't willing, and most of us don't even know. We don't know how. We don't even know what to do. We just, we just religiously have been brainwashed to just look at this by, about a religious thing. So that's what Passover is about. The sun has passed over this mark. And the reason it was so joyous is because the sun has spent six months down here in the cold, dark winter months. And generally when you see the cold, dark winter months, it's referring to death. That's some, not really, literally. It's like when the trees, in the fall, what happens to the trees? The trees begin to lose their life, don't, don't they? The leaves fall off. They, don't they look dead? And they go down into winter and all of a sudden, boom, what happens to the trees? Look at them. They come alive again. That's a perennial cyclical thing happens constantly I mean and so does it does it affect me does anything happen in me that way it does but until we begin to see what's happening and initiate it we get no results from it now now what I mean by that I'm going to elaborate on so you have to stick with me on it so that's the first place that we see this word it's originally it's an astrological word just simply means the sun has passed over 
the cold, dead winter, and now is moving into the warm life of spring and summer. And so uh, then go with me to when it moves into the spring of life and summer, go with me to Genesis chapter 1. What happens when it moves across, it passes over this mark, March the 21st, what begins to happen? Life begins to show itself again. That's the very first thing that shows up. Everything that appeared to be dead now appears to be life. It's like I heard a guy say one time. He said, if you look at the blades of of grass in your yard, there's too much. It's more abundant. You have to cut it. Like we said, now that the sun comes out and the rain has watered it, what begins to happen? The sun and the rain water, it grows. It just grows fast. And so what do you got to do? Keep cutting it. It begins to give you an abundance of itself. The trees do the same thing. They leaf. Everything begins to come to life, right? So what would, it be, would Passover be about life? Yeah, it really is. It's about life. But I want you to look at this, and I'm going to show you some things. And this will, this should begin to speak to you in volumes if you just pay attention and open your ears and you'll see it. Genesis chapter 1. And I want to look at a couple of verses here. Look at verse 20. It says, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly, and the moving creatures that has life. You see that word life? Everybody see that word life? Yes. Yeah? Everybody see that word life? That's the Hebrew word che. And I'm going to put it on the board. It's the cheot and the Hebrew yod. Che. And it's, that's all the glyphs to it. Uh, it can be spelt this way, or it can be spelt K-H-A-Y. K-A. K-A or K-A. Because this glyp is a called a Cheot or a Cheot. And this is called a Yud or a Yod. So you can hear the, the Yud, Yo, Y. You can hear Ch, C. So that's where it comes from. That's what that word means. Or that's what that word that's what that word is in Hebrew. And it means life. But now I want you to see something about it. This particular word in Hebrew actually means to be strong. It means to uh to uh live. It means it, it and it gives you this this first meaning. I want you to hear this. It gives you this first meaning and N U R T U R E. Can everybody see that? Can everybody see that word? What is that word? Nurture. Nur- what does nurture mean? Huh? Nurture is isn't a baby. Isn't a baby. Now help me out. I realize this is basic, but when you get a hold of the basics of this, it's going to it's going to kickstart something inside you that you will wow. Because it has to do with this word. Nurture. It's the first thing that a baby has to have when it's removed from the womb of its mother. If it doesn't receive nurture from its mother or the community or what it, whoever or whatever is, is lifing it, life, then what will it do? What will happen to the baby? It will die. It can't live without nurture. Yet what does nurture do to it? It does more than... The baby learns more than just... Uh, sucking at the at the tit or the nipple, the baby is learning, even though it may not be able to necessarily see good or hear or even talk, it's learning more in the first six years than you can... Comp- Matter of fact, you can take a child at three years old and teach it as much as three languages very easily. But if you wait until that child is eight or nine year old, you have a very difficult time teaching it one language. Why is that? It's because of this right here. Nurture. Simply because that child is a magnet that's drawing from everything in its culture. It's drawing from sounds. It's drawing from attitudes. It, I mean, it can. It, it's just amazing about, that, about the, the knowledge that's in that little infant. But that infant looks for this right here. Nurture. And that's what this word means right here in, in Genesis 1.20. 
che. It means to nurture. It means to give it life. Now look at this word again in Genesis chapter 2. I want you to see that so we can kind of establish this idea. You have to be nurtured from your mom or your parents or your caregivers or whoever. They have to nurture you. And in the nurturing process, if you can hear this, in the nurturing process, you get programmed. And you're being programmed both consciously and unconsciously. You, you, don't, you don't even realize that your mama, your daddy, your surroundings, your atmosphere, everything about you is programming you according to what's going on there. If a child is nurtured at a very early age in a hostile environment, that child will automatically build a strong defense. Why? Because, and the child didn't do anything at all. It's just there being nurtured. And yet it's being programmed the same time it's being nurtured. Even though the people programming it don't intend to program it. Did you know that? It's just like, say, Connie and I, when we were raising our girls when they were little, we were doing things around them, saying things to them that were programming them both for greater, their greater good, but at the same time for their ill, for their lesser good, for their detriment. I was programming things in them that they have attitudes about now that they wonder, where did I get this? And you can say, where did they get it? They got it from the nurture of their parents or their surroundings. They were programmed. So that happens. That's what this word means. So here you see it again in Genesis chapter 2. Look at verse 9. Verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils, in, breathed, the, breathed into his nostrils the breath of... You see what that says? Che. Same identical word. Life. Nurture. That's what that's about. That's what that word is all about. Now go with me real quickly to another place in your Bible. Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9 and Leviticus. Just find these two together. Leviticus. So Leviticus you go Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. It's the third book in your Bible, Genesis, and then Leviticus 17. I just want you to get both of these and look at them together. Now, it's, it's amazing how that they do this with the translations of the Bible, but they do. So like right now, if you read that word life, anywhere you're going to read that word life in the Bible, you would probably think of what I just said. Che, the Hebrew word che. Or so you would associate it with nurture. Or you would associate it with what I was talking about as a child is being programmed from its environment. Being nurtured from it, okay? But now look at this passage here in Genesis chapter 9. And uh, let's see, what verse do we want to look at? Verse 4. Look, look at verse 4. But flesh with the life. Now you see that word life? Now, I want you to see this word. This Hebrew word. <clears throat> now, this is the word for life. And this is the word for life. Do you think that this word, che, life, and this particular word, Right here is pronounced non fe sheen nafesh. Now, do you hear the che nafesh? I mean, they're completely different, aren't they? Do they mean something different? Well, of course they do. This word, but it's translated for the word life. So, this word life, and I want to put the, this is the first thing, nurture. I want to put this second thing up here, number two. Can y'all read that word? Nature. nature. Is there a difference in what nature gives you and what nurture gives you? Because both of them are giving you something. Both of them are offering you things. Both of them are uh, emanating to you. Both of them are all the time. Now this word nature 
And this word right here, nafesh, this word nafesh that's translated life right here, go with me to Leviticus real quickly. And let me show you again over here in Leviticus before I say any more about it. Leviticus, just look at it here in Leviticus chapter 11, I mean chapter 17. Let's just look at one verse. There's a couple of verses here. Verse 14. Just look at it with me in verse 14. It says, For it is, and if you notice in King James, it's, that's those it is, those two little bitty words are italicized. That means they're, they're not even in there. They're, just a, they're fillers. They're, they're styrofoam. They shouldn't even be there. They're just styrofoam. You, you, you know, when you go and you buy topsoil or pot and soil and you open the bag and you start looking at it and it's got all them little bitty white specks in it, that's filler. Ain't worth a crap for nothing. They just put it in there to make you think there's more in the bag than there's in the bag. Uh, it's not any good for anything. Okay, That's what these words are. When they're there, I tell us that. That's all they are. They're styrofoam. They're no good for anything. Shouldn't even be there. But anyway, if you'll notice, it says, For the life. You see that word life? That's this word right here. Nefesh. But look what it says. It says, For the life of all flesh, the blood of it, for the life thereof, therefore I said unto the children of Israel, You shall eat, eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood of it. Well, the blood that's pumping in your veins is the same word as soul. Not any different. If I go back over to Genesis chapter 2, and I begin to read that same verse that I read to you there in verse 7, they do not translate this word nephesh for life. They tra th translate this word nephesh for soul. It it's the soul of it. So the Lord God planned to breathe the soul of it. The soul. Now, that's the nature of it. The nature of it is not the nurture of it. So from the nature of it, what you can gain from the nature is you get the essence of what it is. So you, can you hear that difference? Can, does that make any... Both nature and nurture affect and influence you by this right here. Now what is that? The moon. Yeah, it's the moon. Both the nature and the... Now, now is the moon affecting anything right now? Absolutely. Now, instead of this particular festival that's going on all over the world right now, millions and millions of Christians are celebrating it right at this very moment. The reason they're celebrating this festival this day is because of the moon. It ain't because of the sun. It's because of the moon. Well, let me rephrase that. Let me reconstruct that statement. It's because of the moon and the sun. But it has as much to do with the moon as it has to do with the sun. Now, if the programming that you and I receive is all nature and nurture, nature and nurture will impose itself upon you. It will affect you in all kinds of ways. Logically, psychologically, in every kind of a way that you can possibly imagine. Through nature, through the blood, the body, uh, which, which that's exactly what it's referring to. The nature refers to I mean, nurture refers to your body. Nature refers to your soul. And your body and your soul in union and in, co in communion with each other give you your physical life, the life that you live. Now, your soul is very emotional. And here is a real problem we have in the, in the Christian community and in theology and teaching is most people think the soul and the spirit are the same thing and they use them interchangeably and the same synonymously and they're not the same thing. They're completely different. The word for spirit is, is not the word nefesh. 
The word for spirit is totally different. from the, And many times people associate spirit with God. But they also do the same thing with soul. But the things that I'm trying to say and I want you to understand is that these two right here, body and soul, they will overwhelm you. They will... Uh, they will seduce you. They will deceive you. They'll keep you eating the way they want you to eat. Do you know why? Because it tastes good, smells good, looks good, feels good. And that's basically what they're about. So both of these, the same thing's true about the soul. The soul doesn't care what you do with it. It's just there so that it can help you experience what's happening with it. And the body is the temple. It's just a gift. It's something that God gave us. It's something that God uh, has put within us. Okay, go with me to another passage of Scripture here. 1 Kings. After you go past uh, the first five books of the Bible, and you get through First and Second Samuel, you'll come to 1 Kings. So go with me to 1 Kings. Chapter 3, 1 Kings chapter 3, and look at this passage of Scripture. Verse 11, it says, And God said unto him, Because you have asked this thing, and has not asked for yourself long Life. There's that word again. This is the third time we've seen this particular word, life. You've asked for yourself. You've not asked long life. Now let me put this word up here. Long life. That's yud. That's a dalit. And that's called a final mem. Yud, dalit, final mem. Now this also is a word for life. Now, isn't it confusing already that we have, looking at an English translation, we've already got three words that you would automatically associate the word life with the same. And yet they're not even close to being the same. And now here we got another word. It's translated life right here. He said with long life. You can find this same exact, this word right here. This word, by the way, is called yom. Yom, yod, dalit. Final mem. You can hear the u. Mim, yom, yom. And it's translated life, it's translated long life. In Psalms 91, it says, With long life, yom, I'm going to satisfy you and I'm going to show you my wholeness, my deliverance, my completeness. And then it's translated over about Sarah and talks about Sarah in abundance of life. And so this word here has to do with, with the quality of life. The more of the more of the quality than it has to do with these two up here, body and soul. You see, you can have both nurture and nature and not have quality of life. We can drink ourselves to death. We can smoke ourselves to death. We can eat ourselves to death. And we are nurturing and naturing our body all the time. And our body is just saying, yippee, yoo-hoo. <laughs> Mine is, I'm just telling you about, you know. And these, these words have to do with that. They have to do with nurture and nature. But yet what happens when we come to this particular word, and this word is about long life. This is about living in abundance of life. Now these two right here will happen to you, period. Why? Because their job is just to affect you. Their job is to influence, influence you. Their job is to seduce you. Their job is to give you all of the moon experiences that you can have. And if you'll pay attention, the moon is emotional. That's why a woman's menstrual cycle is cycled on the moon cycle. Why? Because it shows the emotions of it. But it's not just a woman that the moon affects. It affects the female in a man. 
Because every man has both male and female. Every woman has both male and female because you're made that way. You have a right and left hemisphere. You have a masculine and a feminine. Everybody's made that way. Our problem is we segregate and put the women over here, put the men over here, said the women, they are, they are the ones who made all the mistakes. They're the ones who caused all the problems. And so they're not really da-da-da-da-da. They're the servant, the slave of the man. Bull. See, that's where we have so much corruption and so much confusion in this thing that we call the church. So when we come to this third aspect of life, it isn't, it's not about the physical body. It hasn't got anything to do with the physical body. And notice what he says. Again, let's look at this verse. And God said unto him, Because you have asked this thing, and have not asked yourself long life, neither asked riches for yourself, nor have you asked the life of, the, of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding and discernment and judgment. In other words, he asked for balance. He asked for understanding. He wanted to know. And, and you know, the thing about balance, this, is, this over here is called judgment. Scales of justice, Libra, 21st. It's, just, it's where everything is balanced back out. It has to do with the pelvic. It has to do with the creation. It has to do with creativity. That's where your gonads are at. That's where your male and female organs are at. They're right here in the pelvic. And, that, and the pelvic is, is just it's got a left and a right just exactly like the male and female atmospheres of your brain. And if you don't balance out your brain, if you don't, if you don't use the throne room of your, of your brain, the spirit, to go ahead and control the balance of your pelvic, your walk will be in any sort of way that it wants to go according to the nurture and the nature or according to the addiction or according to the draw or according to whatever the flesh just wants to go do. And it will. And, and you know, religion has tried to beat the hell out of us and never empowers to show us anything about this third aspect of life. They don't even really know how to talk about it, to be honest with you. Because of this aspect of life, this is called yom, and this has to do with... Number three. Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you, so you are made up as a triune being, spirit, soul, and body, correct? But you see, the spirit is there as a servant for you, but the difference between the spirit, the soul, and the body is the spirit has to be invited. It has to be asked, or I will say it this way, it literally has to be trained. Why? Because it comes in you as an infant God. And Paul said in Galatians chapter 4, even though you are Lord of everything on the earth, you are still under tutors. You're still a servant until you grow up. What does that mean? Does that mean physically grow up? No, my goodness, you can be 70, 100 years old and still be the, you can still be under servitude of the body and the soul. Most of us are. Why? Because we have not grown the God up in us that we are. We don't know how to grow the God up in us. Do you know why we don't know how? They, the religious system took away this beautiful mystery of the Passover and what this is really all about. What, what is going on right now? What's happening in nature and what we are seeing in front of our eyes. So, this word yom in the Hebrew is actually translated in Genesis chapter 1 and in the second verse of Genesis chapter 2 as the word day, D-A-Y. But actually the word means the fullness of life. And what makes life full, what makes life abundant is spirit. It's the spirit brooding over, just exactly like it tells you in Genesis 1-2, as it introduced in verse 2, the spirit begins to brood over these seven yawns. Here are the seven days of creation. The seven yawns. It's what I call my stick man. Or in other words, it is the construction of the physical body or the temple or the tabernacle in the womb of your mother as the Spirit of God builds its house in that womb. And its house is powered by the life, the yom that God 
has given it, that God puts in it, that God intends for it to have. God wants it to have. So, the first two, the first two of you inherit as a gift. I'm just going to read you some things I wrote in meditating about this so that I don't get, I'm getting anxious and wanting to go in so many different directions. I, I'm trying to put blinders and keep myself geared back. The first two of you inherit, inherit as a gift of your journey here on earth. These two, and these two will, these two right here I'm talking about, nurture and nature. Does everybody, you understand what I'm saying? Does everybody here pretty much understand what I'm talking about? Nurture and nature, you have that period. That's just your physical body. It's who you are right now. The first two of you inherit as a gift of your journey here on earth, these two, and they will overcome you, they will overtake you, they will rule your life. And they do. I don't care how holy and how pious you are, I am, they rule your life. They rule my passions. They rule my emotions. They, have any of y'all ever been so overwhelmed with your emotional thoughts? You're on a roller coaster and you just, you a basket case? I raised both of my hands. That happens to me. I don't have to be stimulated or anything else. My mind can just go crazy. Go all kinds of crazy directions. You know, all kinds of thoughts would just come. Yeah, and where'd they come from? They come from these areas right here. I didn't invite them. They just came. That ever happened to you? You know, you, and you get, uh, uh, and you know, I can just elaborate this to infinitum, and you know it, and you can hear it. I hope you can hear it, and and it it, it it'll just take over you. It will take over and rule your life, and it does. It does most of it. The last one, number three. You are given as a gift also, but it will not overcome you and it will not take you over. It does not. The Spirit of God does not, or the infant God inside you, or I'll say it this way, because this is ancient mythology predating Jesus, the Christ of you will not take you over. It's there at your beck and call. It's there sort of like a sleep in the boat of your physical body. All it's waiting on you to do is awaken it, to stir it, to ask it, to inquire of it, or to ask it to train you and teach you. You see, we go to church. People, millions of them are gathered all over, all over the nation and are going to church, but they don't know that the reason they should be there and the reason the preachers, the pastors, the teachers should be there is to teach them how to awaken and how to raise up and how to energize themselves of the Christ in them. Not worshiping a man historically 2,000 years ago. It ain't about a man historically 2,000 years ago. It's about every human being on the face of the earth and how to raise that energy of spirit up inside them. Because if you don't, if you don't activate it, it ain't activated. It's still there. It's still present. It's still all-powerful. And it's still willing to do whatever you ask, ask it to do. So the last one, number three, you're given as a gift. But it will not overcome you. It won't take you over like these first two. It will not do that to you. This one you have to cultivate. You have to do this yourself. And that is what all of the ancient mysteries were about. They were about cultivating, stirring up this gift of God itself inside its temple, its tabernacle, which you are. So that brings me to something, and I want you to look at this with me. I, I, wrote, I wrote these notes uh, yesterday, pondering this message and thinking about this, and I want you to hear it. it said, what the ori- what are the origins of Easter? So I'm going back to my first question I asked when we started. What is today? And everybody says, well, it's Easter, it's Passover, and it is, it is. What are the origins of Easter? Where's, what, where does it come from? Now, let me show you something. Uh, in 2015. It's 2015. Easter came on April. It came on April the 5th. In 2016, Easter came on March 
the 27th. On 2017, Easter came on April the 16th. On 2018, Easter came on April the 1st, April Fool's Day. And then on 2019, here it is, Easter comes on April the 21st. And you can just go on and on infinite simply because Easter don't ever come at the same time. Isn't that, isn't that kind of strange? Have you ever given that any thought? Don't ever come at the same time. Now wait a minute. If Easter is the celebration of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of a historical person. Now for instance, if I was going to celebrate the death of my mother who died, I forget exactly the date, but I'm just going to say, let's say that she died June the 15th, 2008. Well, do you reckon next year that I should celebrate mother's birth and death date on June the 31st? Huh? No. Why? Because mama died on June the 15th. That's un not negotiable. It's just exactly like I was born on February the 19th. But I think next year I'm going to celebrate my birthday on February the 1st. Now I can do that, but that's non-negotiable. Your birth date and your death date are non-negotiable. So why would we be seduced in Christianity to believe in a historical character, name that character Jesus, and say that he died on, on three days before Easter, but rose from the grave on Easter morning? And it's never the same date. Not ever. Wow, you know what that would do to me? That would put me into a great big question mark. Well, m -m 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 maybe he wasn't historical. Maybe he wasn't really real. Maybe he wasn't literal. If he was real and he was literal and he did die on a certain day, should that day change? Why does Jesus' Passover, death, resurrection, why does it change all the time? You may tell you why? Because it's not about a literal historical man. It is about the moon. You always celebrate Easter on the first full moon after March the 21st. Did you follow that? Always. It doesn't matter. Always. You celebrate Easter on the first full moon. And that full moon can fall anywhere from March the 21st up to April the 21st. Anywhere, in, and it does, as I just showed you right here. So what is the celebration of Easter all about? It's about the moon. But is it about the moon only? No, it's also about the sun. It's about the sun reaching this point right here, Passover, the sun reaching this point, but it's also about the moon and where the moon is at when the sun reaches this point. So the celebration is always held over until the first... wonder why they would call it sun day. Would it be because maybe it's about the celebration of the sun and the marriage of the moon instead of about a historical man? Now I just present that as a question. You don't have to say, well, oh, Lynn... Lynn's is crazy or whatever. Just as a question, just as a thought. You can think about it or do whatever you like about it. So I, write, I want to read you this I wrote. What are the origins of Easter? And in, in the Christian community, it is supposed to be about death or about the cross. Burial, resurrection. Supposedly, literally, and historically. But I just present that question. I just ask you about it. His bodily resurrection after three days in the, in the grave. The word Easter is of Saxon origin. And by the way, the story, this story of Easter or Esh Star, that's the Saxon word for Esh Star, and the story of it is well over 4,000 years old. So the story of Easter, way beyond Jesus' time, it's well over 4,000 years ago. The word Easter is a Saxon origin. It is the goddess of spring. That's what it 
refers to. This story traces back thousands of years in all the ancient cultures. In all cultures. Doesn't matter if it's Mayan culture, South American culture, Egyptian culture, uh, Chinese culture. It don't matter. All cultures celebrate this. Especially on the northern hemisphere. The story traces back thousands of years in all of the ancient cultures to to represent this time of the year. All of these ancient cultures had stories, myths, allegories. All of these ancient stories were about a dying and a resurrecting God-man or a, a creator character. The story of Easter dates back thousands of years and was first known and told as a pagan festival thousands of years before the Jesus story. The word pagan, P-A-G-A-N, the word pagan is an ancient word. And this word pagan out of antiquity was a derogatory term which actually meant country people. Not ignorant people, country people. Or as we would say it in the southern vernacular, country folk. Rednecks. Rednecks, country folk. Country folk or another phraseology that was called pagans were the farmers. Who are the country folk? The farmers. The pagans. They're the backbone of every society. They are the people who run the society. They're the people who keep the society going. They're the people who keep it alive. Today, you and me wouldn't survive if it wasn't for the country folk to bring the groceries to the grocery store. Because we ain't doing what we, what we were doing when I was a kid. All the country folk when I was a kid, we all grew our own. And we grew plenty of it so that we could share it with our neighbors. Country dwellers are farmers. In other words, they were the backbone of the country. Or in some southern states, it's called country folks. The word has and or had nothing to do with demonic worship or people of Satan. You see, you and I have been told that all pagan mysteries are demonic and that those pagan mysteries are of the devil and they're Satan worshipers. That's what we've been told. Who told us that? I'll tell you who told us that. The Roman Catholic Church. They're the ones who tried to tell us that. Why? To deceive us from the pagan mysteries. Because the pagan mysteries were all about what I'm telling you right now. They were all about the celebration of this day, just like we are. But they were all about the truth of the celebration of this day, just like we should be. And the truth of the celebration of this day day, was the resurrection and the raising up of the God-man, that woman, that you are. Not that you're going to be, but that you are. Even though you may not have arisen to your fruition. Maybe you haven't arisen to your power. Maybe you haven't arisen to your ability. The potential is still there. And that's what the celebrations were about. That's what the ancient mystery teachings were all about. They were about teaching you and me about these very things. So uh, this lie comes directly from Rome, from the Roman church. The purpose for this lie was to keep... The ignorant pagans, country folks, that's what they call them, ignorant. To keep the ignorant, ignorant. (laughs) It's still true today. Because you know what? We sit as millions all over this world, all all over America. We sit as millions with educations, with degrees, and still don't have a clue about life, life, and life. We don't know. Nobody's ever told us. Nobody's ever instructed us. So you know what that makes? It makes us ignorant. It doesn't make us stupid. To be ignorant, to be stupid, is to be ignorant just simply means I have ignored this. Or I didn't know this. Or I wasn't told this. Or nobody ever took the time to teach me this. I mean, that's why I do this passionately, whether it's a small group or a large group. It doesn't matter because I see the truth that's in it. I know the truth that's in it. I know that I've been lied to. I've been deceived. I haven't been told the truth by the religious community. And it stirs me up. I get passionate about it. I do. I get very passionate about it. Not just because I see something, because I know what it's done to us and I know what it's done against us. 
And I see it in my own life. I know what it's done to me. And I want to wake myself up, but I want to wake up as many people as I can. I would love to get on the housetop and shout this message across the land. On every television program, every radio program, every newspaper, every even books or anything I can get it in. So people could learn to be who they are and what God's called them to be. So young people could really claim and capture their pleasure, their fulfillment, their desire, their abundance, everything they long for. It would be known to them how to do it because the power is resident in us to do it. But we have to ta- we have to awaken it. We have to train it. We have to do we have to do this part. This don't do you. This you have to set yourself in the classroom of stillness and quietness and study. You have to develop this. You have to raise yourself up. It'd be wonderful if I could do it. If I could do it for you. If I could do it for my kids. If I could do it for my grandkids. I would do it in a heartbeat. I I mean, I would. But you know what? I've come to the place I realize I can't do it. I've tried. I've wanted to. But I can't do it. It, You have to do it for yourself. It has to be done by the individual. I want to read you something from this book right here. Oh, goodness. I got this book. This book was actually put put out on the press in... uh, In 2000 and, uh, well, 99, I'm sorry, 2099. Does this book come out in 2099? Actually, this is the first of a trilogy. There's, there's three of these books. 1999. I'm sorry, 1999. <laughs> I'm sorry, 19. Blah, blah, blah. My tongue's trying to get way ahead of my, yeah, my thought. Uh, uh, this, this book right here has literally rocked and rolled and shaken the Christian community. And a lot of people are afraid of this book. Christian communities try to keep you away from it. But this book uh, by Tim Freaky and Peter Gandhi, The Jesus Mysteries, is the first of a, like I said, a trilogy. There's three of these books. This one came out in 99. The second one came out in 2001. And the third one came out in 2005. Which I, I somehow or another, I got a hold of this book actually in 2001. And Tim Freaky happened to be in America doing a conference in Texas. And so I called him personally and talked to him. And I went to Texas and I spent four days with him. And actually, I was there on a divine appointment because I spent four days with him and I was his chauffeur. So everywhere he went in Texas, I drove him and spent a lot of time with him. And so I really got to know him. And, but this book has literally shaken up the, the Christian community. And there are there are comments in this book and later by people in high places that got a hold of this book. People in high places that talked about it like the Daily Telegraph, CNN, uh, Canterbury News, uh, Professor G.A. Wells, Professor Alvar Elgard, uh, uh, Publishers Weekly, and goes on and on and on about the accolades of this particular book. But this one is just the one that rattles the cage. But I want to read you a little bit from this book, if you let me. If you want, I'll read it anyway. <laughs> it's just good, so I want you to listen to it. He says, At the heart of the pagan philosophy is an understanding that all things are one. The mystery... All things are one. You're one with everything. You're one with everybody alive. You're all breathing the same air. Do you realize them plants are breathing your air? Do you realize you talked to your plants? You remember last week I told you to look at our little miraculous plant worked its way up through that concrete slab, not through a crack. It worked its way up through the through the concrete. That's the power that that little plant shows you the power of what's happening with the S U N and the M O O N. It's the sun and the moon that rose that up. It wasn't Jesus that brought that plant through that concrete? It's the sun and the moon that did that. And what it's doing, what it's doing with that plant, it's doing inside you and me, but we don't know it. Why? Because we haven't been trained or taught how to wake up the divine in us. We haven't been trained how to awaken the Christ inside us. So he says the pagan philosophers 
Philosophy is an understanding that all things are one. The mysteries aim at awakening within the initiate a sublime experience of this oneness. Salateus declares every initiate aims at at uniting us with my left eye don't want to follow everything with my right eye so I see everything blurry at the moment that's getting cleared up you know so I have to I have to try to look at it every initiation in other words an initiation is like a baptismal ritual that's what the word baptized comes from the Greek word baptizo actually means to be initiated and so people goes to they go to church and get into the pool of water and dunk them and they call that baptized. That is the symbol of it. It's the symbol of going into water and coming back up. It's a symbol of dying and being raised again, right? All initiation is this is an initiation this morning. You're being initiated into words, into spirit. Because word is logos spirit. And so that's what initiations are about. They're about teaching you and training you in levels of understanding. So every initiate aimed at uniting us with the world and with deity. You can't separate God from His creation. And you can't separate creation from God. You can't separate yourself from your Creator and you can't separate the Creator from yourself. I don't care who you are or how you try. You're one. You're one with it. Plotinus declares the initiate transcending his limited sense of himself. Listen to it. His limited sense of his self. In other words, his nurturing and nature itself transcending them. In other words, finding a way to go above their effect, above their influence. Is there a way I can be stronger than the influence of my appetite or of my emotion or of my, 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 you fill it in. Is there, yes, that's what the initiations are all about. That's what teaching and training should be about. Should be about teaching me how to become all of the God man I'm designed to be. Hmm. Plotinus describes the initiation transcending his limited sense of himself as a separate ego. Separate ego. That's what ego is. Soul and ego, same thing. And there's nothing wrong with the ego like there's nothing wrong with the soul. The only problem with the ego is if it's controlling you. If it's controlling you, it ain't any different from the appetite of your body if it's controlling you. They will both destroy you. They'll both lead you down a path you don't want to go. Don't they? Yes, they do. Amen, Brother Lynn. I agree, brother. I'm I'm following you all 100%. (laughs) As if born. Listen to it. Here's Here's what Plotinus says. As if born away or possessed by a God, he attains to solitude in untroubled stillness, nowhere deflected in his being and and unbiased with self, utterly at rest and becoming very rest. He does not converse with a statue or an image, but with the Godhead itself. And this is no object of vision, but another mode of seeing, a detachment from self, a simplification, and a surrender of self. You know, I, I've really been listening to that word surrender. Do you know that's one of the hardest things that you and I can do is surrender? But because you know why? Well, bless God, we're going to be in control. Every one of us want to be in control of my life. I want to be in control of what I'm doing. I want to be in control of what I'm eating. I want to be in control of where I'm going. I want to be in control of who I'm seeing. It's hard to surrender. In relationships between couples, it's hard for one to surrender to the other and, and allow... The, because You know why? Because bless God, I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm talking... Good preaching, Brother Lynn. I, amen. I hear you. <laughs> I'm talking to myself here. I'm not talking to y'all. I'm talking strictly to me. Uh, Surrender of self. A yearning 
for contact and a stillness and a meditation directed towards transformation. Whoever sees himself in this way has attained likeness to God. Let him abandon himself and find the end of his journeying. Isn't that a powerful, powerful, powerful statement? Gosh, he's... He, let me just put this book aside. I get cranked up in that book and we won't ever get to the end of what I want to get to. I've got to get to the end of this. Where's my end at? I wanted to read you one other thing right here. Uh, I bet I didn't... I did not write that down. Let's see if I can't find it right here. Alvin Boyd Coon. so much in these books that uh, here we go let's see here we go this is I'll just read you this in closing no man can be told a fact more transcendent more transcendent importance to his life than that in his physical body as in a womb, he is now slowly gestating this body of an infant God, which he is to be. That almost bears repeating, don't it? Did you hear that? No man can be told a fact of more transcendent importance to his life than that in his, in his physical body, his or her physical body, as in a womb, he is now slowly gestating his, in his body an infant God which is to be. And this is that glory body that he will deliver to its birth at the wondrous son, S-U-N, of, as a wondrous son, as, as the wondrous Sun rises because begins today, begins to wake up and rise. Rises as the wondrous sun. Let me see where I lost my place. Rises in his being with healing in its wings. Besides this stupendous fact, all the mass of religious belief that a man in history two thousand years ago died as we die and rose as we shall not rise and that in some incredible way this event became the sole implementation of our eternal life falls dead and meaningless indeed crushes down the spirit of the man beside this twisted fabric of untruth stands the thrilling Realization that our salvation, our resurrection, our hope, nay, our certitude of immortality rests securely upon the foundational fact that our divination is a process that works like yeast in the very body of our life. No man can disillusion us of this salvation or rob us of its reality since under God it is a process entrusted to our own hands. Whew. I hope y'all got that. It can't nobody else do it for you. And when they tell you come kneel at the cross and he will do it for you, you can do it all you want to, but until you take hold of it yourself, until you rise up with the power that's already invested in you, until you begin to realize you truly have a God asleep inside your being, until you get a hold of that revelation and that wisdom and that knowledge, and that's exactly what Easter has always been about. You go back 4,000 years ago, that's what it was about. When they adapted the Jesus story, all the Jesus story was was a story that was, that was put together by the Gnostic Jewish community, or in other words, the Essenes. They wanted their Messiah to take the place of Eshtar. Same story. 
That's how it was told. That's why for over 200 years in the infancy of the church, the church spread like wildfire. It couldn't be stopped. Do you know why? It incorporated all of the mysteries of all of the nations in the one story of Jesus. It wasn't trying to talk about a literal man. It was talking about this miraculous time of the year where we see the energy of the sun and the moon in its grand glory and realize that we are the recipient of that. You can go out on a beautiful day right now and just lay in this this marvelous energy called the sun and energize your body. You can get still and you can get quiet and meditate and quiet down all of your nurturing and all of your physical nature. Quieten that down and God will speak to you. You'll come out with ideas, with understanding, with expansion of knowledge and wisdom. Wow. No man can, let's see, no man can disannul, can disillusion us of this salvation or rob us of its reality. Since under God, it is a process entrusted to our own hands. It's a living process to be studied, to be mastered for its final outcome and its unspeakable blessedness. Hallelujah. I think, and and I could just read on and on because I I wrote, I just write so much. He, He really prods my thinking and gets me stirred to think about different things and uh, different uh, ideas that stir me up and stir my inside from the from the things that I have personally studied and learned. Uh, the things that I have found from the ancient Hebrew studying the Scriptures coincide with all of the ancient mysteries. Even though it's a very confusing book for most people, and I understand that rightfully so because it is. Because just like I just showed you right there, we have three different words that are translated for the same English word, and you're not going to go through there and just read that and get what I just showed you unless you can understand or see the Hebrew. When you do that, it starts to open your eyes and change your whole perspective, the whole the way you see things. So my word for us this morning, encouraging word, is that the God in us is being stirred and is longing to stand up in us. And that's not a salvation call. That's not a get saved call because those words are so grossly misused from their original meaning. The word sozo is the Greek word for save and it means to be whole. You know why? Because you're not whole. You're mostly, com- you're mostly divided. Jesus said a divided house can't stand. You're divided from your true nature. People come to church, why? Because, well, it's just another Jesus story. They don't want to go. They don't want to hear it much anymore. I mean, you can't can't hardly get the young kids to accept it anymore. They're not paying attention to it, which is a good thing. Now then, they're open to hear the real message of what it should be about. And it should be about awakening the God of yourself so that you now can cultivate that and stir that up and build that up. Amen. So I'll stop right there.